Let's go back and look at an old text and see what it has to say to us uh, today, to look at Ezra chapter 4 and to seek to understand God's message uh, to us today. I'm going to read verses 1 to 5, and then I'm going to ask you to jump to the final verse of the chapter for reasons I'll uh, explain uh, a little bit later. Uh, So we're we're going to have a fairly short reading today, Uh, but let's read now from Ezra chapter 4 and verse 1. This is the Word of God. The enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were rebuilding a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel. So they approached Zerubbabel and the other leaders and said, Let us build with you, for we worship your God just as you do. We have sacrificed to him ever since King Esarhaddon of Assyria brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the other leaders of Israel replied, You may have no part in this work. We alone will build the temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, just as King Cyrus of Persia commanded us. And the local residents tried to discourage and frighten the people of Judah to keep them from their work. They bribed agents to work against them and to frustrate their plans. This went on during the entire reign of King Cyrus of Persia and lasted until King Darius of Persia took the throne. And then if you turn, please, to verse 24. Verse 24 that says, So the work on the temple of God in Jerusalem had stopped, and it remained at a standstill until the second year of the reign of King Darius of Persia. Well, do have uh, that passage open before you as we come to look at it in detail, continuing our series, Rebuilding from the Ruins, uh, and we give the title of this talk, Opposition and How uh, to Face It. Uh, One of the areas of medicine that we've understandably become more interested in in the last year is the area of vaccinations. And it's been fascinating to see uh, the reports on how the coronavirus vaccine has been created, how the uh, developers of the vaccine analyse the virus to understand how it works, to find out uh, how it attacks, how it undermines our human defences and breaks into our cells. And on the news now and again, they've shown graphics of the way uh, COVID-19 kind of works and takes hold. Uh, Because once you understand how this invisible enemy works, how it gets in, what its strategies are and its threats, then that is how you can take steps to guard against it, to resist it and defeat it. And we're all uh, very grateful, aren't we now, for the vaccines that have been uh, uh, created and are now available. Uh, Knowing your enemy and understanding their strategies and how they attack is very important. Just ask Boris Johnson. But it's also important spiritually, because as God's people, we also face an enemy, an evil, invisible enemy who seeks to attack, to undermine, and to destabilize us as individuals, but also as churches, and to sabotage God's work. And it's vital that we don't lose the the sight of the reality that he is there, that he's real, and that he is at work, and that his aim is to damage our Christian lives and to bring down churches. Which is why Ezra chapter 4 is such a very helpful chapter chapter for us to look at because it alerts us once more to these realities. It operates in many ways like a siren that warns us of enemy attack and points us to the way we are to guard against it. Uh, For us as Western readers, uh, it's a bit of a strange chapter because the chapter as a whole doesn't work, as it were, in a straight linear timeline. Uh, which is why we broke up the reading the way we did. I've just put a slide up uh, on just to uh, on the screen just to show uh, how it works. You see, verses 1 to 5, five deal with the, the current situation following on from the events of chapter 3. But then there is this long section from verse 6 to verse 23 that actually deals with a different period of history. And then the story from verse 5 then jumps forward and continues in verse 24. And this long diversion in verses 6 to 23 actually deals with some events uh, years later, but the writer inserts them to kind of give us a flavor of the kind of opposition the people faced in verses 1 to 5 and then verse 24. So it's a bit like being in a history class at school with the teacher talking you through uh, events of the reign of Henry VIII. 
And then when he comes to a particular event, uh, what he does at that time is to explain the event and situation by referring to a more recent event in English history. What was it like? Well, it was a bit like what happened in that later situation. And that is the kind of approach that the writer of Ezra chapter 4 is using. He's given us a kind of history overview here from different time frames to show us that throughout all these times, God's people have always faced opposition and God's work has always been opposed. It's an approach that was used by Eastern writers at this time. But it's fair to say, when you read the chapter, it can get a bit confusing. So have a read of it in your own time, the whole chapter, and hopefully that will make it a bit clearer. But that is why we're just focusing on the few verses that we read this morning and following them in a straight line from chapter 3. The other thing to clarify is in the second half of verse 5, just have a look at that, where we read, This went on during the entire reign of King Cyrus of Persia and lasted until King Darius of Persia took the throne because uh, as we saw a few weeks ago King Cyrus was also known as King Darius Uh, the King Darius who was on the throne when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den and Cyrus seems to have been known as Darius the Mede but then the Darius that's mentioned in verse 5 is a different Darius so I think he's referred to as Darius the first so the royal running order looks a bit like this we have Cyrus also known as Darius the Mede he's the guy who's around at Daniel's time Uh, he conquers Babylon in 539 BC the exiles return in 538 BC we then have another king on the throne Cambyses and then we have Darius the first after that and so that's the kind of running order to have in your mind I hope that's clear are you with me so far That's fantastic. Well, let's get into these first uh, five verses and see what they have to say to us as God's people today. And firstly, these verses show us the stand that we need to take as God's people against compromise. Uh, Do you see how the chapter begins with a confrontation here? On one side, uh, we have the people of God, the people of Israel, who are referred here as Judah and Benjamin, because they are the two tribes of Israel that most of the exiles uh, returned and came from. Uh, And then on the other side, there is this group of locals who live nearby. And in verse 2, they come and they approach the leaders of God's people with an offer. They say, let us build with you, for we worship your God just as you do. We sacrifice to him ever since King Esarhaddon of Assyria brought us here. And so they come and effectively say, look, we, we want to help you with your building project. Let's pool our resources. Let's share the load. And on the face of it, it seems like a pretty good offer, a pretty attractive offer, doesn't it? And so the question is, why is there this rather blunt response then in verse 3, where we read, but Zerubbabel Jeshua and the other leads of Israel replied you may have no part in this work we alone will build the temple for the Lord the God of Israel just as King Cyrus of Persia commanded us and you wonder as you read that verse if there were those uh, who were perhaps near to Zerubbabel and Jeshua perhaps accountants who looked at them in disbelief at this point and kind of felt like saying guys why are you refusing this help You don't look a gift horse in the mouth like this and turn it down. You know, perhaps you should rethink your stance here, particularly, after all, as they seem to be on the same side as us. They say they worship our God too. But the truth is, Zerubbabel and Jeshua see the issues very, very clearly, and their stance is spot on. You see, just have a look at the beginning of verse 1. Do you see how right away the writer lets us know that these... uh, these guys aren't friendly potential co-workers but they are enemies and if you turn back to chapter 3 verse 3 that is where we first meet them where we read even though the people that is the people of God were afraid of the local residents they rebuilt the altar at its old site and so now here at the beginning of chapter 4 these are the same antagonistic local residents that we met in chapter 3 But there is a second reason why Zerubbabel and Jeshua are right to turn down this offer. It is because it was coming from people who weren't true worshippers of the one true God. There is a giveaway in verse 2. Do you see how these uh, locals come and they say, For we worship your God. In other words, he isn't really their God. 
You might remember when we uh, began this series how we saw that many, many years before, after the nation of Israel was divided into a, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, the northern kingdom was conquered by the Assyrians. And that with the Assyrian strategy, with the territories that it acquired and conquered, that they sought to then uh, populate those new territories with a mix of different people from a range of different places, which means that the northern kingdom be began to, to be made up of a kind of pick and mix selection of peoples from a range of different countries. And then the same thing happened as the Assyri Assyrians then later conquered much of the southern kingdom of Judah under the rule of this king Esarhaddon, who is mentioned in verse 2. Which means that as the exiles returned to this recolonized area, they were surrounded by lots of different people from lots of different places, following lots of different religions and worshipping a variety of other gods. So it was a very mixed up area spiritually too. There was no true pure worship of the one true God of Israel amongst these people. They may well have worshipped the God of Israel now and again to kind of put a tick in his religious box, but that worship was mixed in with worshipping a kind of variety pack of other gods too. We're given a window into it in another part of the Bible in 2 Kings where we read these words. Though they worshipped the Lord, they continued to follow their own gods according to the religious customs of the nations from which they came instead of truly worshipping the Lord. So I, I guess to put it in our context, we would say this about them. They weren't true Christians. Sure, they may have come to church at Easter and Christmas. They may have put a tick in the Christian box on a census, but they also had a Buddha statue in their garden, a copy of the Koran on the bookshelf. They had New Age crystals in their lounge, and they touched wood at every single opportunity. And of course, God always sees through that religious smoke screen, doesn't he? And here he sees that these people have hearts that don't truly love him, that don't truly worship him. You cannot fool God. In the book of Isaiah, God speaks directly to people who do the kind of outward religious stuff with no inner reality in their hearts. And he says this about the sacrifices that they bring. He says, stop bringing meaningless offerings. And you see, that is the position that these people are in who come and offer to help Zerubbabel and Jeshua. Their hearts aren't really in it. They don't really love God. They don't love him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so Zerubbabel and Jeshua are absolutely right to reject their offer of work and offer to help with God's work here. You see, they know they cannot work with false worshippers because they know that like a virus, what happens is that these people's wrong, mixed-up beliefs will contaminate, they'll infect the community of God's people and pull God's people away from worshipping him as it had in the past. And so in verse 3, what they do is that they draw a line in the sand and they say, you may have no part in this work. We alone will build a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel. They see that they need to guard and keep the purity of of their faith, the purity of their identity as distinctive God's people, that they need to commit themselves here to really obeying the word of God, to putting it into practice as God uh, uh, lays it out, to avoid the problems of the past. Uh, some of you may remember the kind of tragic uh, shipwreck of the Italian cruise ship, the Costa Concordia in 2012, when uh, the captain foolishly took it too near the coast and it hit an underwater rock capsizing it. And for many years, that wreckage just simply remained at the scene, a constant reminder and a warning to other captains who sailed their ships in the same area. Don't sail too close to the rocks. And you see here in Ezra chapter 4, it is as though the captains, the leaders of God's people, are very conscious of the wreckage of their past. They're very conscious of the way their forefathers shipwrecked their faith and their relationship with God by compromising 
by gradually allowing the influence of other nations and other religions to creep in and contaminate. And so here they are absolutely determined not to repeat the mistakes of the past, not to compromise for an easier life, but instead to take the stands they need to take to take those stands to protect the purity of their faith, to guard their relationship with God, even though they know probably that it will bring consequences. And their stand, their example, is a massive challenge to us, isn't it? And it's an encouragement, too, to take the stands that we need to take in our situation, in our lives, in our time, to draw the lines in the sand that God calls us to draw and not then to step over them and some of those stands will be similar but some will also be different today it's fair to say isn't it we face so many challenges to our faith there is a a need for us to pray constantly uh, for God's wisdom as we negotiate what feel often like uh, very difficult and dangerous spiritual seas to sail through and there is this great need for discernment And we need that discernment sometimes when there are approaches from those who do come alongside and offer to work with us or who encourage us to work in partnership with them. Even, we have to say, sometimes from organizations who on the surface claim to be Christian. So in every instance, in every situation, with every approach, we need to look at them and consider them through the lens of God's word and ask questions like, do they really hold to the truth of God's word? Do they really believe and seek to share the true gospel, the same good news of the Lord Jesus Christ that we believe in, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And also, are they committed to upholding the behaviors and the relationship designs that are outlined in God's word? Or today, are they compromising on them? And are they taking on the world's values and the world's morals instead. And if they are, then our stance and our stand needs to reflect what we see here in Ezra chapter 4. You see, God's people then were called to build a temple. But as God's people today, we are called to the gospel work of building the church of Jesus Christ. And it is a work that cannot be shared with those who don't truly belong to Jesus Christ and who don't hold fully to his teaching. And when the tide, as it were, of the world's values approaches, instead of drawing a line in the sand based on God's word that we don't step over, the great temptation is, of course, always to rub out that line and just draw it further back, isn't it? To compromise instead of confronting. Because it's much easier to do that. But it is a temptation we need to resist. Because that kind of compromise has two very dangerous and damaging effects. Firstly, it infects the church with wrong thinking. And secondly, it weakens the church by pulling it away from God and pulling it away from his word. And in the end, we have to say that compromise has the ability to shipwreck the faith of individuals and to cause lasting damage to churches. But behind all that, we also need to see that these temptations to compromise are actually a key strategy of the devil. A key strategy of the devil to weaken our witness, a strategy to undermine our trust in God's word and in God, to take our eyes off the Lord Jesus Christ so that, like Peter, who begins to sink as he walks on the water to to, to the Lord Jesus Christ, we focus, as it were, on the waves of the world instead of focusing on Jesus and we falter in our faith as a result. And we also need to see that this is the way the devil attacks the Christian message itself. Because when the church waters down the message of Christ, when it kind of airbrushes out the seriousness of sin, when it dilutes the demands that Christ puts on our lives, our behaviors, and our relationships, then there is a real danger that people come to Christ under false pretenses. That they don't really understand who they're following and they don't really understand what it means to follow him. And so it becomes Christianity without taking up your cross daily. 
It becomes discipleship without the demands of the gospel. It becomes a diluted gospel, a watered-down message. And it won't bring people into the kingdom of God. Because you can only enter the kingdom of God if you are truly willing to make Christ Jesus your king. And so firstly, standing against compromise, but secondly, seeing opposition for what it is. So often in, in war and in conflict, there isn't just one battle to face and win. There are a series of different battles from different situations as the enemy attacks from a range of different angles and with different strategies. And here do you see where the compromise angle fails. The enemies try a different strategy. In verse 4 we read, Then the local residents tried to discourage and frighten the people of Judah to keep them from their work. They bribed agents to work against them and to frustrate their plans. It reads a bit like something from the Godfather movies, doesn't it, really? It is a strategy of intimidation and probably a strategy of violence as well. And then there are these hidden strategies of bribery and corruption, perhaps whispered plans in the corridors of power, speaking to dodgy political advisors. We've had a lot of that in the news, haven't we? And do you see how this response from the local residents exposes their true hearts? Because, you see, if they were genuine worshippers of God, then they would have been very happy for that building work to continue, no matter who did it. Which suggests that their offer of help earlier on wasn't as genuine as it may have seemed on the surface. That perhaps they were simply looking to work in the project from the inside to hinder instead of help. And then sadly, just have a look at the final verse of the chapter, verse 24, which tells us this, shows that this new enemy strategy works, doesn't it? It says, so the work on the temple of God in Jerusalem had stopped and remained at a standstill until the second year of of the reign of King Darius of Persia, which is a delay of about 15 or 16 years. And it isn't a very encouraging end to the chapter, is it? Uh, We prefer it to end on a note of hope, an optimistic end, but it ends with a very disappointing final sentence that leaves us hanging, leaves us waiting and wondering what is going to happen. And so in the light of all that, what does this chapter possibly have to say to us here and now? Is it simply to prepare us for a difficult phase of our building project? Well, we hope not. That may be a possibility, but we hope and pray that it isn't. But very definitely, it should encourage us not to be complacent in prayer. But to keep bringing that building project to our Lord in prayer, asking for his guidance, his help, his provision, not to be complacent. But actually here, the primary message of this chapter for us, and for God's people in every generation, is actually to show that God's work will always be opposed that it will always be opposed by the world and always be opposed by the devil. And that is the sober reality it calls us to see. That wherever the kingdom of God is built, because it is being built in enemy territory, there will be opposition. Opposition that may come in all sorts of different forms. It may come in vicious persecution, as some of our brothers and sisters across the world uh, have to experience in different countries. Or it may come in the anti-Christian legislation, Uh, that is passed by those in power who are gradually seeking to remove the impact of Christianity from our society, to to shut God out and to stop his voice being heard. All that opposition is sometimes more localised from the people we know, from the friends we have, from the colleagues we work with who call us to compromise to leave our, in their eyes, outdated views and way of thinking completely behind and to buy in to the new ways of thinking, the man-made morality and the propaganda that's being pushed uh, so viciously today. And when we refuse, well, sometimes just like the locals in Ezra, we may then experience a more forceful opposition. But do you see that behind all this human opposition, we are to see that there is an invisible enemy who is pulling the strings, who is working in the shadows to attack God's people, to halt 
God's plans and frustrate God's purposes. In fact, the message of Ezra chapter 4 can be summed up by a verse in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, which says, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And in Ezra chapter 4, it is as though we hear him snarl and roar. And it is a very timely and necessary reminder for us as God's people today that we have a very real spiritual enemy who is active, who attacks, and who seeks to undermine God's work because he hates God's work. But we do know our enemy. And we know how he works and we know how he attacks and how he sometimes, like here in Ezra chapter 4, works through circumstances and other people the opposition of others. And so this chapter calls us to be watchful in our Christian lives, to be a bit like those lifeguards you see on those uh, beaches uh, on Australia, in Australia, on those viewing platforms, looking out for sharks, guarding uh, against attack, ready to sound an alert when there's an attack that could emerge and a threat that's coming. And we need to protect ourselves. And we need to protect each other and the church family that we're part of as we seek to resist those attacks from our invisible enemy. Sadly, at times, we can fall into the trap of losing sight that Satan is there. We we can become a bit like the captain of the Costa Concordia, of being complacent about the spiritual dangers that lie there beneath the surface, about, about sins and about temptations that can damage our faith. And so as a result, what happens? We don't steer our lives away from danger, but we can sail too close to it. And heartbreakingly, we have to say, there are many spiritual shipwrecks that remind us of the consequences of not taking this enemy seriously. And we need to make sure we don't make that same mistake. Of course, the devil's strongest form of opposition is seen most clearly in the way that he opposed the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus himself had to endure his direct attacks, but also attacks through other people who opposed him. But the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. And of course, at the cross, what looks like a scene of victory for the devil and defeat for Jesus is actually the scene of Jesus' greatest victory, victory over sin, victory over death, and victory over Satan, a victory by God's grace that we share in. And although, as in Ezra chapter 4, we find ourselves in a period of history now where that victory isn't fully seen, and where at times those who oppose us seem to be so successful in their opposition towards God, A day is coming when that victory will be seen in all its glory and all its triumph. A day when the Lord Jesus Christ will turn the last page of human history and return to bring a final, ultimate defeat to the devil and then to take his people home to a home where there will never be persecution or opposition that will ever touch them ever again. But until then, what are we to do? Well, actually, the answer follows in the next verse of the part of 1 Peter that we looked at a few minutes ago, where we read these words. Stay out, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. And so what are we to do? Well, We are to stay faithful to Jesus Christ. And we are to watch out for each other. And we are to encourage each other. And we are to pray for each other that collectively and individually we may take the stands that God calls us to take in our context, in our time, in our situation, which we do not do in our own strength, but which we do depending on his power and on his strength and his resources and on his great victory and trusting in his great promises that he will give us all we need to take the stands that he calls us to take.
And as we close, two things very, very briefly. Jesus makes it very clear, talking to his disciples, that they will face persecution. It is a reality of following Jesus Christ. It is an inevitable part of the Christian life. But Jesus says there is another key part of the Christian life, and that is to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us. And that love, I think, becomes easier when we remember that our enemies are in the grip of an invisible enemy as we once were. And so we need to pray that they too would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and come to know his liberating power and the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and be freed from Satan's clutches so that like us, they move from being enemies of Jesus to being his friends. And finally and briefly, there is one final question that this chapter forces us to address and consider and that is this, where do you stand with Jesus this morning? You see, Jesus said, whoever is not with me is against me. That is, if you're not following Jesus, then the reality is that you are opposing him. Actually, the Bible says that if you are not on the side of Jesus, then you are on the side of the devil, which is very hard to hear, but it is true. You see, you cannot be undecided towards Jesus. You can't be a floating voter. You, you have to vote for living for Jesus or not living for Jesus. But the great news is that this morning, at present, you still have the opportunity to turn to Jesus, to move to Jesus' side, to do that by putting your faith and your trust in him. And so this morning, let me encourage you to do that while you still have the opportunity to receive his forgiveness, to experience the new life that he promises, and to finally be free for an enemy who wants to keep you in chains.